Well, uh, yesterday, uh, does anybody remember our name of our fashions yesterday? Outdated fashions. Today is discarded fashions. This is Margie. Cindy doesn't have to be my uh, mannequin today, our model. She enjoyed that very much, but this is Margie. She's going to, yeah, she, um, she bent down. So, but she'll do. And thank you for bringing her. Yesterday I said, I wish I had a mannequin, and poof, one appeared. <laughs> Somebody said, I have one. Uh, so let me get this going here. What, what do I need to do, Jocelyn? It got disconnected. Just give me a second. Oh. I hate that when it happens. We have a professional here. <laughs> Don't draw attention. You should start talking. Oh. <laughs> So our discarded fashions, uh, my assignment was 1 Peter 2, verse 1 to 3. If you would look at that, uh, we'll, we'll probably be there and other places. I'll try to have some things on the screen for you. Which says, wherefore, 1 Peter 2, 1, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow near, thereby. And if so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Notice the first word, wherefore, is going to point back to chapter 1. Because Peter had just been discussing the relationship between Christian growth and brotherly love in chapter 1. And now he's going to move forward with some specific instructions about the behavior of a Christian. Yesterday, our theme ended up sort of being about how to be holy. And if God is holy, we're holy. He says it, we say it. He hates it, we hate it. And that holy is something that we are not to resist. It's something that we're to strive for. To be, because we read a verse that said, no man can see God unless you're holy. So, you know, the Lord has always been interested. Uh, interesting that my three lessons have been on the theme of fashions. But it's in interesting that... Uh, the, the, the Lord has always been interested in how his people dress. And if I need to take a break, and I think he's fixing it for it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what he's doing. Okay, I'm going to keep going. The Lord has always been interested in how his people dress. Always. Uh, in Exodus 28:42, I have this on the screen if we get to it, but... Uh, if you have a digital that you can get there or, or just want to turn there in Exodus chapter 28, verse 42, he is instructing the very details about their priests and what they're to wear and what they're to do and where they're to go and all the pattern of the temple and all of that was supposed to be done according to the pattern. Well, he told the priests in Exodus 28, 42, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even to the thighs. And I'm thinking this is, you know, your thighs down to your knees. So even under all of their robes and all the garb that they wore, they were to have linen breeches under here. Maybe we'd wear leggings under a dress. And some people would say, well, that's overkill, you know. Well, it, he's saying to cover their nakedness. Sometimes they were climbing up and doing things. And they needed to be covered. He's always cared about that. What about the demoniac from the Gadarenes that Jesus healed in Luke 8? That story goes on between Luke 8, 26 to 39. In verse 27, Luke 8, 27, And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, that wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. I think we're, yeah, we're right here. Luke 8, 26. So he's, he meets this man that's got a bunch of devils in him, and th these are some of the things that Jesus was, uh, did miracles while he was here on earth to prove to people, I'm who I say I am. And he had, even over this, this realm, he had, he had uh, dominion. So here's this man, and then you know the story. He healed the man and cast the devils out to the swine that were nearby, and they ran off the cliff. But notice what else changed when this man was in his right mind. In verse 35 of Luke 8, it says, Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. See, the 
demoniac man wasn't clothed as long as Satan held him bondage. But he was clothed after his encounter with Jesus. Jesus, God has always cared about how his people were dressed. And if we'll keep our eyes open when you're reading scripture, there's a lot of little things you can pick up about our clothing and being clothed and not clothed. But it takes spiritual maturity to submit to God's will about our clothing, especially in 2023 America when we're getting so many messages to do the opposite. We lived in Tanzania in 91 to 94 and, you know, different, completely different culture in every way. And uh, we learned then about uh, how we dress, and it matters. Uh, we would put on our uh, walking shorts, three couples, and we would walk around the mission. We had about 317 acres there that the church owned. And we would walk to get some exercise, you know, in the afternoon, and we'd visit and catch up. And, and so one day I asked the hospital administrator, was a Tanzanian, very educated man, and he knew both the cultures. And he said, um, so I said, so Bernard, is this okay? I mean, I know we're not going to wear shorts out in town or, you know, obviously church or anything like that, but is this okay that we're walking around the mission, you know, with our walking shorts on? He said, oh, yes, Mama, you are American. You can do anything. I thought, well, that pretty much sums it up at home, too. When we went back in this August and September, we were there in Tanzania just like yesterday, and things are different, but they're the same. And so we took mostly pants. I had a dress. In fact, I had this one because you can wad it up in a suitcase. And I wore the Sundays that we were there, but I had pants on. But I wrapped a conga around my waist to give the appearance of, you know, I'm a woman. I'm not a man. And so when, when you're, you know, we're conscious of how to dress appropriately so that we would seem correct, you know, representing myself as a child of God in whatever country is important to do it the right way. And it takes maturity to deny ourselves what I want, what I think looks cute, and what is appropriate for a child of God to have on. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know many of you, but my size is constantly changing. That's why I need a bigger house, is just to keep all those clothes when I wear them again. I've been every size there is. In my attic, I have a tub. And I've kept these clothes, and I'm going to get in them one day. <laughs> the smallest size is the corduroys that are size four. I don't know about that. <laughs> but we do that. We women, we keep those clothes because we're going to wear those clothes one day. I, don't want to, I want to grow as a Christian. I don't want to grow that way. When we become a Christian, we're a babe in Christ. Cindy talked about that. There's two reasons that you're a babe in Christ. Either you're a new Christian, you're of the elect, 1 Peter 1, 2, or you're a babe in Christ because you just haven't grown since you became a Christian. You're, you know, in Hebrews 5, 12 through 13, you have need that one teach you again the first principles. There are some people like that. I, I think you've probably got some in your congregation like I've got some in mine. They just don't do anything in order to grow. Think about your physical growth. I mean, first you're a newborn, then you're a little girl, then you grow into a young lady, then you're a woman, then you're a mother, then you're a grandmother, and then you reach maturity. You know, that doesn't happen. You don't become a grandmother in two days or two weeks or two years. It takes a long time. It's the same as a Christian. First you're a babe, Hebrews 5.13. The Bible says you're unskillful in the word. And then you're a little child. In 1 John 2, 12 and 13, they're called little children. They're called young man. And I write unto you fathers. They're, they're called, you know, so it's all about growth and this analogy that he's using. And then you reach spirit, spiritual maturity. Hebrews 5, verse 14, strong meat belongs to who? Those that are of full age. And then your perfection is reached, your fullness in Christ. Hebrews, uh, Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love that you may grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ. But however, um, in order for you to grow, there's some essential things that have to be done. And in our keeping with our fashion that we're doing, um, there's some putting off that we have to do. There's some laying aside that we have to do certain things. You know, laying aside, this is uh, kind of a weight loss thing. I, I, we, we always, always, always say, I'm losing weight. Well, see, I quit saying losing weight because I don't want to find it anymore. If you lose something, you're, you're going to find it. We're going to put it off. I'm going to get rid of it. 
That's what, that's what I want to do with that. But laying aside, in, in, when the Bible talks about laying aside, that's a one-time act result, resulting in a permanent state of going forward. I have put this down. I have put this aside. I've taken this backpack of weight off and I've put it aside. And now I'm going to go forward without it. Now, when we become Christians, some things, some fashions for us go out of style permanently. And we don't go there anymore. But with our fashions, our clothes, we save them. We're going we're gonna to get the, you know, I said, I wish I had my bell bottoms from 1979. <laughs> my mother had a dress shop named Smart and Sassy. She told everybody it was because she was smart and my daddy was sassy, but I assure you it was the opposite. But so, I, you know, as a teenage girl, who doesn't want their mom to own a dress shop where new clothes come in all the time? But I had 30-inch bell bottoms. You felt a breeze when I walked by you on my big pumps. <laughs> you know, the type that were tight to the knees and then boom. I wish I had those. I couldn't get in them, but I wish I had them. Um, but those things that are in my attic, you know, I'm probably not going to be able to wear. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to save them. But one day, you know, I'll get them out. But we save things like that. If we had a big enough house that we could save all those bell bottoms and all that stuff, you know, the kids today, they think they thought of all this new stuff. We're like, ah, we were doing that 50 years ago. But, you know, things seem to come back in style. Fashions do, they like the bell bottoms, and we wouldn't wear some of the fashions that they have today. And I don't think they're, they're going to go away eventually. They always do. And I hope they don't come back in style. Paul said that there are some things that we need to put off, Ephesians 4.22, that we, um, let me see if I'm supposed to be helping y'all out. Nope, I'm right. Nope, nope. We don't go backwards on this, do we? <laughs> I fixed it. Uh, I think we've got to stay there till we go to the next one. Paul said there were some things that we've got to put off in Ephesians 4.22. Listen to this. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. For a Christian, there are some styles that we just don't need to save. Because for us, they're not coming back in style. We're not going to wear that anymore. And notice how many times all is said. Okay, so I'm going to advance the first thing is the outdated dress of malice. You ever stopped and think about these things? Uh. Oh, Margie said, ouch. Everybody in here went. I stuck a thumbtack in her. All right, this is the outdated dress of malice or wickedness. We're going to put this to the side when we become a Christian. We're not wearing it anymore. We're not going to save it in the attic. This is an evil disposition and a malignant spirit, the desire to injure another. And then the definition, part of the definition that I looked up, said this, this word malice is saved for people we hate. Are we supposed to even have hate as a Christian? We're not supposed to be wearing that one anyway. Malice is this disposition that I just want to hurt you. So whatever opportunity you give me to do it, I'm going to take it. That's what malice is. Maliciousness is in Romans 129. It's a characteristic of those who have forgotten God. And there's a lot of evil characteristics there in Romans 1. In the Old Testament, they were not to keep the Passover with the, quote, old leaven of malice. In 1 Corinthians 5 a, it says, but with the le unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Malice is part of the old man. And in Ephesians 4.31, they were to put off. In Ephesians 4.32, and be ye kind one to another. That's the opposite. He's teaching us how to behave. But be ye kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath given you. I know that she drives me crazy. Just something about her. It's like fingernails on a crop on a shop board. I can't explain it. Every time she gets around me, she just makes remarks that just get on my last nerve. In my head, I am pecking her while she's talking. There are those people. And I'm probably that person to somebody. You know, do you ever think about that? When you run into somebody that just gets on your last nerve and jumps up and down on it, maybe I'm that to somebody else and I don't know it. But 
Love means I fix my mind on I, she's my Christian sister, and I'm supposed to love her in the way that Cindy just did that fervent love lesson. I'm supposed to love her. If I fix my mind on that and look for things about her that I can like instead of always dwelling on, there's that same old characteristic I can't stand, then my actions will follow. And maybe I need to do, maybe I need to make myself do some actions so that my mind will fix on the fact that I'm supposed to love her. Do I want to be holy? Do I want to put away malice? Do I want to just keep thinking about this until I do have the opportunity to act like she acts to me? And, and dig her a little bit. That's that, that's that idea of mouth. That's outdated style. A person who enjoys hurting or, how about this one, or embarrassing others. Like I just really like it if I can point out that, you know, your shoes are the wrong style or did you mean to wear that sweater that's too small or, you know, embarrassing somebody in front of other people. Or you go ask my husband to dance and I have to hit you with a magazine. <laughs> Um, it's the same as a grudge or an ill, just having ill will towards somebody. We just enjoy seeing somebody else experience pain or, or distress or just ruining their reputation. We all know people like this, but Christians, that, that's an outdated style. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be wearing that. One. So we're going we're gonna to put that to the side. We're not going to do that anymore. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cindy, come hold for half of the word. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I thought that. Oh, I, with a couple of them I wrote on the back, I thought, oh no, I just cut up guile. Okay, the outdated dress of guile. <laughs> Definition I have up here is to catch with bait, cunning with the intent to deceive. Being good at deceiving in a clever way. You know anybody like that? Who does that sound like? Does it sound like Satan? I think I heard somebody say that. To be good at deceiving in a clever way. That's straight from Satan. 1 Peter 3.10 says, The man that would love life and see good days must not let his lips speak guile. In John 1, 47, you read about Philip bringing Nathanael to, as one of the disciples. How many of you think Nathanael was one of the 12 disciples? Uh, Jesus called them one by one, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Then came Philip, Thomas too, Matthew, and Bartholomew. That's Nathanael. That's another name. In John 1, 47, he had never met Jesus, but Jesus already knew his character. He, he said that Nathanael was called an Israelite in whom there was no guile. He said, when did you see me? You don't even know me. He said, I saw you under the fig tree. Jesus knows all. He was just beginning to meet Jesus. This, dated, this outdated style is a, a person who is sly. Uh, a narcissist gaslights you into questioning reality. They're sly. They're smart. Criminals sometimes, you know, they're really, really smart in the way they go about it, but they're dishonest. <coughs> Duplicity. They're two different people in two different places, maybe three. And they're hypocrites. Oh, and I have, an, I have another dress that we're going to wear, and this time I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna tear it up. Did I hit that again? No. I'm managing a lot over here. Margie, I'm sorry, girl. We're going to put off the outdated dress of hypocrisies. Um, these are acts of insincerity. And I, I looked up the word hypocrite, and the, the basis of it comes from actors that are playing a role, and most of the time wore a mask. The, they're playing a role that they do not live in, in real life. And the mask is so other people can't see them, that they're not really that person. Kind of like our Hollywood actors today, they, they leave their part and they really think they're still that and all that in a bag of potato chips, you know, when they're out among us too. But hypocrites do this. They wear a mask and they pretend to be somebody that they're not. This is not a fashion suitable for Christians. We don't need to wear this one. Christians need to not only appear to be following Christ, so their church family will think a lot of them, 
who did that and, and paid for it with their life in the New Testament? Ananias and Sapphira. No one said they had to sell their land and give all the money to the church. Nobody makes you do that. But why were they saying that? Because they were hypocrites. They wanted to get the attention from those around them. Oh, look at that. They, they sold all their land and gave all of it to the church. Wow, I want to be like them one day. They're hypocrites. She didn't know he told the lie already and he was dead and they'd already taken him out and she said the same thing and the same thing happened to her. But we have to not only appear, and only God knows our heart, but we have to not only appear to be following Christ, we have to really be following him. Jesus condemned hypocrisy. Matthew 15, 7 and 8, he said, Ye hypocrites, this people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And what, what's the only thing that God really wants from us? Our heart, which is this. If he gets this, he doesn't have to worry about how we dress. He doesn't have to worry about us if we're going to be at the gospel meeting. He doesn't have to worry about us if we're going to be at Bible class. If he gets this, and we know he's first in our life, everything else comes back, he doesn't have to, we don't have to answer the question, is my son going to play at the baseball game on Wednesday night? It's already, it's already been decided. God's first, everything else goes, fits around it, or we don't do it. You know, that's our attitude. But this, this outdated style, when we're this, it's like saying one thing and doing another. We want everybody to think we're following God because they'll be pleased. Having one foot in the world and one foot in the church has got to be the most miserable place to be. And you know what? God really does wish you'd pick a side. Because lukewarm Christians really kind of ruin it for the rest of us. Do you have those buildings that is chiseled Church of Christ in the concrete above the building, but they are anything but now? We've got one in Salem. It still says Church of Christ. And Eddie said, I wish somebody would go up there and fill that in with concrete. Because they are not the church of Christ. God really wishes that we would, you know, instead of one foot in the world and one foot in the church pretending both places, it's a miserable existence. And he really wishes we would just pick one. He wishes that we would be on, on his side. But hey, if you're not, at least get over here and 100% do whatever you're going to do. I wish you're with us and for us. If you're not for me, you're against me. But one foot in and one foot out, that's got to be miserable. And you'll soon be found out. Okay, next thing we're going to put on is the outdated dress of envies. We all know what this means. But we're going to talk about it. The outdated dress of envies. Let me switch this. My definition is feelings of unhappiness because another has that which one desires himself. Should be end quote there. Envies. Acts of ill will as other people experience good fortune. Do you know people like that? And they don't say anything bad, but while everybody else is going, oh, that is great. I'm so glad you're getting to go on that trip. I'm so glad you got that degree. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Then there's always one person that's not saying anything. Have you heard the thing with, I can usually keep my mouth from saying it, but my face gives it away. Well, I hate to tell you, but it's the same thing. You conveyed the same idea. And so if everybody else is celebrating this person's good fortune and this person is standing back, could be that that's their problem, is envyings. One who harbors feelings like these is displeased and aggravated at another's good success or blessing. How forthcoming are we with compliments? I'm very uncomfortable if I'm the, in the center and people are all about me and they're complimenting me about something that makes me, I want to talk about how ugly my nose is or how flat my feet are or something. I want to, I think women in general are like that. We're not really comfortable with all the compliments being showered on us. But this is a person who when everybody else is getting the compliments, doesn't give them. And, and we have to kind of work at it. I, I know how I feel when somebody tells me good job and pats me on the back and I need to be sharing that same thing. It's very common in our world today. I, I taught in schools all my life from elementary, wow, those are full of drama. 
and I left there to go to middle school where there wouldn't be any drama and boy did I <laughs> I skipped high school because those people are crazy and then I went to college and there's lots of drama and I was I was in charge of 27 uh, pre-service teachers who were doing their internships and their student teaching. <laughs> Ms. Gilpin, the principal called me to the side and said that my dress was too tight. I said, well, then it is. <laughs> Go change. Um, but Miss Jones has owned the same thing I do, but Miss Jones has a contract and you don't. So anyway, there was plenty of drama there to go around too. But it's very common to besmirch or downgrade another's reputation just for fun in the halls of those schools I saw it. Other teachers who were skinnier and prettier and had creative things outside on their bulletin board outside their door and the principal seemed to like. And those reputations would get besmirched in the halls of those schools. Solomon said it was rottenness of the bones, Proverbs 40, 30, 14, 30. Here's some things that uh, envying does. It's, it's terrible destruction is what it is. It crucified Jesus. It sold Joseph into slavery. It raised opposition to the apostles. It's a mark of carnality and it's a work of the flesh. It's not something that a Christian would wear, this envyings. I envy you because you have this large group of friends, and I don't seem to be able to keep one. I envy you, I have a sense of resentment towards you because you've attained something that I want to attain, but I just can't ever do it. You got that book published, and I've always wanted to do that, but I can't seem to do the work and get it together to do that, so I'm just going to be mad at you for doing it doesn't make any sense. Envying doesn't make any sense, but it is real. We're actually unhappy because they achieved it and we haven't. And we can envy about wealth, and that's relative. I've lived in a third world country. I guarantee you they would take anything any one of you have. You're rich as can be. Uh, but it can be envy about your wealth. It can be envy about your beauty, which is also relative. Um, or your honest reputation. Envying can go either way. But this outdated style does not belong on a Christian. We need to take that up, put it away, and don't put it in the attic. Get rid of it. When we refuse to celebrate another person's success, when we take, actually take joy at another's setbacks or failures, you know women do this. We are so catty. I am one. I can say it. Men are just, hey, you know, we can't live together anymore. Next year, I'm going to go home and live with my parents. And okay, and it's over. But we are like, oh, oh, well, what are you saying? Well, I, you know, I cleaned the bathroom as much as you did. I mean, we just get, just get all bent out of shape. We are catty. But to, to see someone that usually, in our eyes, they've had all of these successes, and we're just a little tired of it. And then one day, something not so good happens to them. And outside we say, oh, I'm so sorry. And inside walking into our car, we say, well, I guess you're not all that. You know. And it usually happens to people who are just kind of dissatisfied with themselves. They don't like themselves. So they have trouble liking anybody else, too. And this other one, I'm glad I didn't rip up envies, is evil speakings. These are the words taken out of 1 Peter. And I was just going to try to look at them a little deeper. Disparaging, hold on a minute. Disparaging or belittling remarks about the reputation, the worth, or the character of another person. Defamation. The same Greek word as evil speakings is translating backbitings in 2 Corinthians 12.20 and James 4.11. And the verb form of evil speakings is speak against in the chapter after this one. 1 Peter 2, verse 12. This outdated style, very ugly, and it's to say mean and spiteful things about a person who is not present. I have seen that. I have, I have seen when a woman do an acrostic of a very bad word that none of us would use and a word for each letter. We had to talk about that. 
describe someone? Yes. Yeah. The word is bad. Yes. And they made an acrostic for five descriptive words. Yes. We had to talk about that. And we're not friends anymore, but that's okay. I don't, I don't need that kind of friend. Discussing nonsensical things about a person behind her back. Nonsensical. Like just silly stuff. Doesn't even need to be said. You know, the think, T-H-I-N-K, before you say something, think. T is, is it true? H, is it helpful? I can run down these things real quick now. I, is it, oh, should have written this down. N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? If I can't, if, if what I'm about to say, does anybody know what the I is? Important. Is it important? Thank you. Um, if I can't say that about what I'm about to tell, then just keep my mouth shut. It's probably something silly and nonsensical. I just don't even need to say it. A lot of times, you know, we've got 144,000 words a day versus our husband's 10,000 words a day. And he's already out by the time he gets home. Uh, and that's why. It's because we just tell stuff, you know. We're just going to say stuff. And, and, oh, yesterday, you should have seen what she had on yesterday. She does not need to be wearing that. You know, just stuff. It's nonsensical, silly stuff about a person behind their back. What did Mama say if you don't have something nice to say about somebody? And Thumper said it too, don't say nothing at all. Yeah, that's hard. Using curse words in daily speech, I think that's something you just decide to do or not do. I mean, telling dirty jokes to get, you know, everybody to laugh. But they're, they're off color, they're talking about body parts, they're talking about relationships we have no business even talking about, and they're just... Silly, but I, I'm talking about people in your life. You know these people. They're, it's filthy and it's foolish. And Teresa Hampton, you know, you see and hear lessons at PTP and PTP Spark that you won't hear anywhere else. You just do. Just practical stuff. And one time I went to, anybody know Teresa Hampton? I look up some of her books. She's a wonderful lady, um, longtime friend. But one of her sessions at Polish in the Pulpit years ago, about 10 or 12 years ago, I saw it on the magazine, I thought, oh, that's one place I'm going to be. Because I was having a little trouble navigating from the 30s to, the, to 50. Right in there, I think it's tough. Because you still got some of your high school, college friends you've had for a long time, and you really love them, but maybe they're not walking the same walk that you're walking, and you got to split up. But you just don't know how. Is that allowed? Can I drop friends? Am I supposed to split, split up? Well, her session was called, this was the name of it, I'll never forget it. Sometimes you got to cut your girlfriends loose. That was her lesson. I said, oh, I'm going to be there. Because I was in that 40-something, like, ah, I got these friends that do these acrostics and not really comfortable with that and I didn't know that that would come from her and I'd known her a long time I don't understand that and what should I do and say she said if people are not walking the walk that you're trying to walk what does uh, 1 Corinthians 15 33 say about evil companions yeah they're gonna pull you down and that's what she said she said it in a matter-of-fact way and I left there thinking I've got some girlfriends I need to cut loose and I did Voila, guess what? The earth didn't end and I'm better for it. Sometimes you do. But that's just an outdated style, evil speakings. Sometimes you've got to cut your girlfriends loose. And when we become Christians, it's time for some new fashions. Those are music to my ears. If Eddie Gilpin came in and said, you, my dear, need a new wardrobe, I'd say, let me get my purse and you get your wallet. We going. That's music to me. I love to get new clothes. As a kid, when I got tennis shoes, I promise you, I, there is no sign, science that goes along with this, but I promise you my new tennis shoes could run faster than my old tennis shoes. <laughs> it's just, I don't know what it is. They just do. But some clothes just look good on us. They just do. Just the way we carry ourselves or the way we're proportioned, our body, the color, our skin tone, and our hair. Usually people will come up to us when we have this outfit on. We don't think it's anything spectacular, but we've got this dress or outfit on or this color, and people in different places in town will come up to us and say, that is a cute outfit. You look so good in that. That looks good with your, your hair color. And we go, well, thanks. And, and what's our mental note? Wear those 
we're going to wear this again. If we want to go somewhere and feel like we're looking good, this is the one because we're getting lots of compliments on that. And as we grow, we might need to get other clothes that fit us. One thing we should always think about is Jesus, our example. When we're talking about these kind of clothes, this is always our example in how we behave. These kinds of clothes, we, we do have to also look to Jesus as our example. What he wears, we wear, not literally in clothing. But it's, you're giving off some kind of sense. You know, what, what, it, what do I say when I walk down the street with this on? Well, what do I not say? I'm not young. <laughs> I'm not uh, looking for a man. I'm not available. I mean, your clothes, whether you want to or not, they say something about you. So when I look in the mirror, I, I kind of think about that. Okay, what does this say about me? <laughs> it might say about me, I need to put my fork down, but sometimes that's been what I, the answer I've come up with when I looked in the mirror. But it's time to put on some things when we become Christians, Ephesians 4.24, and that he put on the new man, the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That was yesterday's lesson. Uh, here's what we need to put on. I got one more. Margie, I'm going to stick you one more time. We can wear the suit of sincerity. I used to have to wear a suit every day to, to work. But you know why? Because Virginia Tech wanted their professors to look professional. They didn't want us to be confused with the girls, with the short, tight, pajamas, silk, you know, whatever. Wear a suit. Look professional. Look like what we're paying you to be. The suit of sincerity always fits the Christian just right. The sincere milk of the word. There was this ancient custom I read about that in that day and time that they would take the milk for the baby and mix it with gypsum to add volume to the milk. It was this chalky substance and it was white. And it added volume to the milk. There was more of it and I guess the baby got full but it was not nutritious at all. It was just a filler. Peter's instructions are to desire the sincere milk of the word. Another word we could put in there for that, a synonym, is uncontaminated. The word is pure. It's uncontaminated. And we, as Christians, are supposed to hunger for that gospel. You don't have to make a baby eat. Those Gilpin boys, I could be on the other end of the house when they got ready to eat and they were in their crib waking up from a nap. They could peel the paint off the wall letting me know I am hungry. You don't have to make a baby eat unless there's something wrong with them. He or she will wake you up out of a dead sleep in the middle of the night with your husband's fan going on the other side of the bed in the winter because they're hungry. Many new Christians are not hungry for the word that they need to grow. They're not, they don't have an appetite for it. They're not being taught this is what you need to eat. I know congregations that have no appetite for the pure truth of the gospel. They tell the preacher, you know, don't be so hard about everything. You're going to run people off. We're not going to be able to pay our bills. They don't have an appetite for the sincere milk of the word, the pure gospel. They don't have an appetite for it. And just like parents make sure that babies eat what they need and not what they want, elders, good elders, make sure that the congregation is getting a well-balanced meal. That they're eating nutritious food. Some of the things they want and some of the things they don't want. But they need to eat it. They have gospel preachers in to do gospel meetings and preach to the congregation that they have checked into. And that they also know preach the sincere milk of the word, the pure gospel. They make sure that that congregation is being fed. And I know this one is doing just that. And your people grow and there's unity and harmony among the people because we're all striving to do the same thing with the pure gospel of truth. Nutritious food is the pure word of God. Milk for babes, Hebrews 5, 12, and 13. Meat for the more mature, Hebrews 5, 14. And God's word is referred to food several times in 1 Peter 2, 2 that we're studying the milk of the word. You know, it's hard. Think about this if you're a preacher and you've got people on all, all the spectrum. You've got new babes in Christ. You've got some that are eating a little meat. You've got very mature Christians. And you're supposed to present a lesson 
that satisfies everybody. And then you hear somebody say, well, I just didn't get anything out of that. Well, I wonder how much they put into it. You're, you're there to study, and if you've got a man presenting the pure gospel of truth, you, know, you need to appreciate that. And, and your time will come next Sunday, and it'll be something you're really into. That's the same thing about uh, teachers. You've got every, everybody on the spectrum, but that's what we're supposed to be doing. When we put on these clothes of wanting to grow, others can see us, that we're a new Christian. They can see that we're trying to wear new clothes. We're trying to, we've put aside, we've, we've let go some of the old things that we had with the old man. And these things are always in style with God. We want to be more like him. We want to look like him. We want to behave like him. And when I walk down the street and somebody sees me in these spiritual clothes, they know something's different. I loved your note yesterday, the note exchange between the condo and Cindy, you know, she knew what the carnal person wanted her to do. I want to go over there and tell you what your kids have done. But she didn't. She chose the other way. She chose to act like Christ. And then it had a, a good ending. Clothes that we grow into. Hmm. I have stopped growing. If there's any growing going on here, it's out. I, I'm not going to get any taller. I've been this tall since I was about 15. If we're buying for a child, though, I used to buy them a little big because I knew all things being equal, they were going to grow into them. And if you, grow, if you buy it to fit, in a month or two, it's going to be too small. I don't want to grow anymore. But for a Christian, that needs to be, we need to be in this obvious atmosphere of a person who is seeking to grow. I want to grow. When people don't show up at Bible class, and I know there's nothing wrong with them, and they do that habitually, and they come every now and then. But basically, their seat is empty during Bible class. You know, what does your empty seat say about you? One of the things it says to me is uh, that they think, okay, well, I know everything. I don't really need to go to Bible class. That, that's probably not what they're, they're thinking they're saying, but that's what they say to me. I'm there because I want to grow. And on my last day here on earth, there's going to be something I need to know because I don't know everything. And so when you don't show up, I, that, I, to me, that says, well, I guess they think they know everything. Uh, something that prohibits our growth is those evil companions I, I mentioned while ago in 1 Corinthians 15.33. And if we're, it's a funny thing, if you're around like-minded Christians, if you're around them a lot, that actually accelerates your growth. It doesn't prohibit it, it accelerates it. Being around like-minded people, Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling, I-N-G, is not the assembly, it's the assembling. When we get together, you're there. The Gilpins are, we just decided when we got married, and Eddie was not a preacher when we got married, that, that the Gilpins were just going to be these weird people that they were there at all the Bible classes and all the kids are all going to be there and at every VBS and gospel meeting and everything, we were just going to be Jesus freaks. We're just there all the time. And if the Gilpins didn't show up, you better go call because something's happened. You know people like this. They want to grow. And something's going to be said that makes them a better person. Hey, I never saw that in that verse. Let me write that in that margin. That happens every Bible class for me because I want to grow. Uh, I know we have access to TV now, but you can't exhort one another. You can't love one another. You can't sing to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You can't do any of that when you're at home watching it on TV. I'm glad we're back to assembling together. And also exercise, which is a dirty word to me. I used to be a runner and I don't run anymore. And ugh. But it's time to exercise when you put on these clothes. Maybe think of them as workout clothes. Because there's things that are part of growth that we need to do, hey, spiritually and physically. Exercise is part of it. Singing, giving thanks, submitting, bearing fruit, bearing much fruit, abounding work, and having your senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It's possible if we just apply all this. You know, yesterday, my oldest grandson, Brody, turned 13. That really makes me feel older than turning 60. Is having a, a, a grandson that's a teenager. And we called him last night and we already sent him what we were going to give him for a gift. But that took 13 years for him to get to that point. 13 years ago yesterday, I just held him as a newborn babe. That took time to grow. And it does take time for us spiritually too. And as a Christian, there just has to be this atmosphere that that's what we want to do. Growth takes time. It takes attitude. Teenagers have, usually have plenty of attitude. Not the right kind. But growth takes incentive. It's no secret that you want to grow. That's why I'm always at Bible 
class. That's why I'm always at the ladies' night out. That's why I go in fellowship hall and go to the ladies' class. Strong incentive. So, <laughs> let's end up our lesson today on fashion with this idea of putting something away for good. Like, I don't want to lose weight. That implies I want to find it again, and I don't want to find it, but it usually does come back and it brings friends whenever it comes back. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 25 and 31 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of another. You know what we do affects everybody else. No man is an island unto himself. John Don. And verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. There's that word all again. All examples of this in each category. Put them away. That's what Peter's saying. We talked in chapter 1 about growth and, and the body. Well now, here's some specific things that you need to put away or put on. God's always concerned with how we dress. And once we've encountered Jesus, just like the de demoniac man, we should be different too. And there are some fashions that we need to put on some that we need to put off, and some that we need to put away. But denying ourselves, if we say deny, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, deny ourselves means we're following the example of Christ. Every day, we're to get up and say, Jeannie dies, today it's about what Christ wants from me. And what I wear, and what I say, and where I go, and how I act, and how I react. Jeannie died. Jeannie wants to say, hmm, hmm, hmm. But I can't do that because I've got the clothes of a Christian on and it affects everybody around me how I act and what I say. We grow as a Christian to the point that we put away some fashions for good because we realize those do not represent Christ. And it takes a mature Christian to come to that point. We're supposed to have, have um, patience with newer, younger Christians, but definitely don't act like them. So let's discard those fashions that are out of style for a Christian and don't get them out again. They're always out of style for a Christian. Tomorrow, we'll end this series on fashion, uh, on uh, inner fashions, the hidden man of the heart. So I hope you'll be able to be there for that. And I think it's lunchtime. Thank you for being here.